Now, when I tell you that the journey that this story took me down literally blew my absolute mind, I somehow stumbled upon this story and upon digging deeper and deeper, I ended up into the world's biggest rabbit hole, leading me to pose the question, is it possible that Bruno Mars may be being exploited by a major casino in terms of his residency whilst exploiting his vices? I know that is a lot, that's a mouthful, that's a lot to get into. But when it comes to Las Vegas, it is the city of perpetual neon lights and unceasing activity, especially late at night. And Sin City stands as a testament to society's age-old fascination with fortune and chance. Known globally as the gambling capital of the world, it attracts millions of visitors every single year. Drawn in by the allure of winning big and the thrilling uncertainty that accompanies every single dice roll and spin of the wheel. However, beneath its glittering surface lies a deeper and darker underbelly of compulsive gambling an addiction that can be a destructive force destroying lives and tearing apart families now i've seen gambling addiction firsthand one of the jobs the many jobs it is that i had before i started doing youtube was working as a store manager for an arcades company you know those little slot machines like a whole store full of those slot machines and i've seen people lose all concepts of time and even people who have asked me to reserve machines so that they could pawn furniture in their homes gambling addiction is no joke gambling addiction thrives in las vegas and this is why they call it sin city and through the lens of the seven deadly sins pride greed wrath envy lust sloth and gluttony it's pretty clear to see that all of these things can live and exist in the world of las vegas additionally though it kind of somewhat parallels the pursuit of fame in hollywood another arena where luck and chance plays a significant role in determining one's success and failure and speaking of success and failure I expected Juvia's Place to fail this challenge. Juvia's Place has recently released the new Velvety Matte Liquid Lipsticks, where they decided to relaunch their popular Velvety Matte Liquid Lipsticks. Juvia's Place challenged me to put their liquid lipsticks to the test. Are they transfer proof? So I decided to do the paper towel test to make sure that they lived up to every expectation. It feels good, it's giving very much velvet. Now here is gonna be the real test and I'm doing this in real time, fresh sheet, okay? They say that this shit doesn't transfer. So let's see if they're lying. Bitch. See it there, see it there. You did the damn thing, Juvia. Now again, as you can see, matches my skin pretty much completely. So this is what I would consider a nude for my dark skin tone. The test again. Can we do it? See it there. Real talk, I'm eating a greasy pizza as I'm doing this. And she ain't even moving. Like, I'm genuinely surprised. No transfer, y'all. She ain't even moving. I mean, I wasn't supposed to give you the pizza test, but here it is. You know what the real test would be? What? So I can't put that in the advert. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see if Juvia's place did it one last time. Should we see? I hope this works out for you. I genuinely do, because this one, not many companies can get it right. Okay, let's keep it for real. Yes. You did it. The nudes range from black, brown, and neutral tones, as well as reds that will match every single tone. Juvia's Place Velvety Matte Lipsticks most definitely passed the test. There are so many different colors that I am unable to show you, but if you guys do want to purchase this, please make sure to go over to juviusplace.com and use your code PETTY at checkout for a discount. Thank you so much, Juvia's Place, for continuously supporting me and allowing me to put your products to the challenge. And without further ado, let's get straight into the video. You know
know it ain't every day. But sometimes we gotta do it. Somebody gotta do it. These, that's a bet. Fifteen hundred dollar hundreds folded, that's a bet. Hey, they can't stop it, just cop it, so that that's a bet. Hey, secure the bag, remove the tag, know that that's a bet. Hey, no chick watches, sh- popping, hold it, that's a bet. Hey, fifteen hundred dollar hundreds folded, that's a bet. Hey, they can't stop it, just cop it, so that that's a bet. Hey, secure the bag, remove the tag, know that that's a bet. Hey, no chick watches, sh- popping, hold it, that's a bet. Hi guys, what is up, what is good, what is Gucci? It is your girl Paige Christie here bringing you yet another video. I know I have been away for a very long time. I had a few health issues, but I am feeling a lot better now and I am ready to bring you guys some solid content. And my team have been working a lot, so we have a lot to get through in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. We're gonna be uploading frequently again. But before I start today's video, I also just wanted to give you guys like the biggest thank you of all times. Obviously, we with my sole job being YouTube, I was extremely worried, especially in this like financial economy we find ourselves in, that I wouldn't be able to like literally make my mortgage payments the following month because I needed to take some time out to be sick. Like there's no sick pay here at YouTube, sweetie. But I wanna thank every single one of you guys who continue to watch videos of mine, re-watch old content, creating playlists, and just keeping my views up on this channel so I didn't feel like I was falling behind. I really appreciate it and it has helped me out significantly and I know that a lot of you have made a conscious effort to do these things so I really appreciate you guys thinking of me in that way. It's really sweet and I don't want to cry because I did my makeup okay. But with that being said before we get into like the literal meat and potatoes of today's video we really need to kind of go over who Bruno Mars is for those of you who may not be familiar and hopefully some of his backstory will also make sense as to some of his personal decisions that we will get into a little bit later. So without further ado, let's get into chapter one. Who is Bruno Mars? Hey, secure the bag, remove the tag, know that that's a bet. Hey, your chick watches, pop and hold it, that's a bet. Hey. Bruno Mars, born Peter Jean Hernandez, was born on the 8th of October 1985 in Honolulu, Hawaii. He is a singer and songwriter who made a name for himself in the early 2000s by writing songs for popular artists. After establishing himself as a top songwriter, Bruno Mars emerged as a singer in 2010 with the hit Nothing On You. His other well-known songs include Just The Way You Are, released in 2010, Locked Out of Heaven released in 2012 and the Granny Award winning Uptown Funk released in 2015 as well as That's What I Like in 2017. Bruno Mars grew up in a musical family in Hawaii. His dad Pete, who is named after, was a Latin percussionist and his mother Bernadette or Bernie was a singer. The nickname Bruno came from his confident and strong-willed nature as well as being named after an extremely well-known wrestler. His family performed a Las Vegas style revenue in Waikiki Beach, featuring Motown hits, doo-wop melodies, and celebrity impersonations. This musical environment encouraged Bruno Mars to pick up instruments from a very early age. Learning to play instruments such as drums, piano, and guitar all on his own. By age four, Bruno Mars was performing as an Elvis impersonator in the family show, becoming one of its stars. As he got older, he added Michael Jackson to his impersonations. Bruno Mars attended Roosevelt High School where he formed a band, The Schoolboys, and continued performing. The amount of early stage experience that Bruno Mars was able to garner in this time honestly set him up for the road to fame. After high school, Bruno Mars moved over to Los Angeles in order for him to pursue his career in music. Initially, he struggled to make headway and grew frustrated. During this time, he began to just purely focus on songwriting, stating, I only started writing songs when I moved to LA because when I was in Hawaii, I never really needed to. He learned from an early age that success required self-reliance as well 
well as writing songs that people want to hear. On numerous occasions, Bruno Mars has even stated that he wants his music to create moments. But then came his career breakthrough. Bruno Mars met songwriter Philip Lawrence and together they began writing and producing music for other artists. They wrote hits for several popular acts, including Flo Riders, Ride Around, Brandy's Long Distance and Travi McCoy's Billionaire, of which Bruno Mars was a feature. Bruno Mars also co-wrote Kanan's Waving Flag for the 2010 World Cup. However, Mars's breakthrough hit would come through with a song titled Nothing On You in 2010, a collaboration between himself and another popular artist of the time, rapper B.O.B. Well, your name's B.O.B, so they're calling you Bob. Stop playing that you do know that I'm known for the Bob. The single reached number one on Billboard's Top 100 charts, launching Bruno Mars into the spotlight as a performer. Shortly after that, in October 2010, Bruno Mars released his first debut album, Do Wops and Hooligans. The lead single, Just The Way You Are, topped Billboard charts yet again, proving that it was not just a one-hit wonder success. But beyond that, the album itself actually reached number three on the Billboard album charts. Other hits from that album include songs like Grenade, as well as The Lazy Song. Bruno Mars also contributed to It Will Rain for the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 1 soundtrack, further establishing his success. Two years later, Bruno Mars then releases a second album titled An Orthodox Jukebox. This was another commercial success with songs on that album such as Locked Out of Heaven, which was huge back in the day, When I Was Your Man, which was another huge track, as well as Treasure. Treasure, mm -mm, that's just what you are. He's got hits, girl, he's got hits. The album received critical acclaim as well as commercial success, earning Bruno Mars a Grammy for the best pop vocal album in 2014. The following year, he collaborates alongside another producer by the name of Mark Ronson on the song Uptown Funk, which again became a huge hit. Another song with critical as well as commercial success that garnered him multiple numerous different awards, as well as lawsuits, but that's a conversation for a whole nother day. So whilst Bruno Mars was known as a hit maker, he hadn't really solidified himself as one of like the greatest of all times. Well, I would say that was until his performance at the Super Bowl. Bruno Mars performed at the Super Bowl halftime show in 2014 and returned in 2016 alongside Beyonce and Coldplay. In 2016, he released his third album titled 24 Carat Magic, which included hits like the title track, as well as others like That's What I Like. Due to this album's success, he completely swept up the 2018 Grammy Awards, winning six of his nominations, including Record of the Year, Album of the Year, as well as Song of the Year. I mean, at this point, point nobody could touch Bruno Mars. When we are talking about some of the greatest pop artists of all time, we now have to, have to include Bruno Mars and his impact on pop music. But then Bruno Mars decided to work on an entirely different project that kind of seemed to have come from left field, considering the kind of music it was that he was making before. A more soul and funk infused album with elements of blues. And this wasn't an album of just Bruno Mars by himself. He was doing a collaborative album with another artist by the name of Anderson Pack, and they created a duo called Silk Sonic. In 2021, Bruno Mars teamed up with Anderson Pack to form the duo Silk Sonic. Their debut album, An Evening with Silk Sonic, featured the hit single Leave the Door Open, which won multiple Grammy Awards in 2022, including including best record, best song, best R&B song, and best R&B performance. 
And this is what led me down the most ridiculous rabbit hole that I could not get my head out of. Because of this Silk Sonic album, I had become a new fan of Anderson Pack. I had never heard of him before, but he has quickly become one of my favorite artists. A couple of days ago, I was just searching for his name on Spotify, and I'd noticed that Anderson Pack had released another album. But it wasn't as Silk Sonic or even as a solo, but a duo with another producer. This led me to think wait hold on what what happened to silk sonic they had one of the best commercially successful albums of all time what would be the motivation for an artist like anderson pack to go from working in a duo with bruno mars creating silk sonic and the album an evening with silk sonic that garnered so much commercial success to now working with relatively unknown producers in order to create other albums it was like his career was taken a step backwards so i went on the internet and i wanted to find out why were they friends were they even talking well you know how the story goes we don't talk about bruno Okay, so Anderson Park, real name Brandon Park Anderson, is an American singer, rapper, and producer based out of California. He released his first album in 2012, around the time that Bruno Mars was gaining commercial success. And in 2016, he released another album, his second album titled Malibu, which received the Grammy nomination for Best Contemporary Urban Album. Anderson Park actually won his first Grammy Award for Best Rap Performance in in 2018 for his song that was not on any albums called Bubbling. Then in 2020, he ended up getting two more Grammy Awards, Best R&B Album as well as Best R&B Performance for his fourth album, Ventura. So Anderson Park isn't like some small time artist that isn't to be scoffed at. However, I would say that he was relatively unknown to a degree when it comes to commercial success. He was critically acclaimed, but when it came to commercially acclaimed, he didn't really have those badges in the same way that Bruno Mars did. So when they collaborated as the duo Silk Sonic, this kind of came as left field to those who do know and follow Anderson Pack's music because Anderson Pack also used to be a part of a duo called No Worries, which was a duo that formed in 2015 alongside record producer Knowledge. On October 21st, 2016, No Worries, the duo of Anderson Pack as well as Knowledge, released their album titled Yes Lord. In between that, Anderson Pack forms Silk Sonic and then goes on to have the huge commercial success. I need you to follow me on this journey. But then, more recently, on the 7th of June 2024, No Worries reforms again and then produces their second album, a part two to their first album of Yes Lord, another album titled Why Lord. So when I, as a new Anderson Pack fan, saw that Anderson Pack had new music out with a completely different person in fact the old producer that he had his old duo group with i was kind of confused as to why somebody who was garnering such commercial success would somehow go backwards in a way that didn't really make sense for the trajectory of his career but then my head was like well you know anderson pack is a very much like he's a music lover maybe it's not about how big the person is or how far he can go maybe it's just about producing and good music with good folks but i don't know even i didn't believe that rhetoric that i was putting into my head so i wanted to find out why and also what happened to silk sonic so my first former protocol was to go onto the Silk Sonic Instagram page. And I had noticed that on all of their social medias, the duo Silk Sonic had not posted anything to social media since 2022. We are now midway through 2024. And that wasn't making any sense because Silk Sonic were doing so well. I'm talking like the amount of commercial success they had. They were literally ramming these people into the throats of children. Like Fortnite had Silk Sonic skins and things it is that you could buy that was related to Silk Sonic. They were doing adverts for major brands. None of what was going on made any sense. 
So that led me to the belief that it's possible that maybe Bruno Mars as well as Anderson Pack are no longer friends. And maybe it's just as simple as that. They're not friends. They don't F with each other. They're not creating music anymore. So, you know me, I delved a little bit deeper. And that's when I found an article. And I will reference the person. Their name is E. Dink. I think that's how you would pronounce that. And they posted to Reddit a think piece titled The Terrible Truth Behind Silk Sonic. We're gonna have a read of it and then we'll go through where this went even worse. So it's titled The Terrible Truth Behind Silk Sonic. I believe that there is something fishy going on in one of the songs on Silk Sonic's self-titled album. Silk Sonic's album follows a traditional narrative of a love interest and a breakup finishing in the song Put On A Smile. After that, there are three more songs that don't follow the chronological order of the album, yet they are still related. Skate is about being with a girl, and Blast Off is about getting high with a girl. Then there's 777. But unlike the other two songs, or any of the other songs, for a matter of fact, this was not about a girl in any way. It was about gambling. Not gambling with a girl, just gambling for the fun of it and for the thrill of winning big. Completely unrelated, nothing to do with any of the other songs, and it just feels so out of place. Besides that, I had no other thoughts. That wasn't until tickets for their tour went on sale, and I noticed that they were only performing in one place. MGM in Las Vegas. Weird. I remembered this distinctly because I wished that they were performing somewhere near me so that I could go. It was a pretty odd thing to do as most artists go on a big tour around the country for a great album like Silk Sonic. So maybe MGM in Las Vegas got an upper hand? That's when I remembered that song 777 just seems just as out of place as this. Suddenly I connected the dots and realized there was a connection between the song about betting and winning it big and the venue that was hosting Silk Sonic, MGM. MGM would be making all their money from the Silk Sonic tour and that random betting song would definitely make them a bit more money too. While residents gambling their free time, MGM got themselves a pro betting anthem through this, which is also crazy to think that there is a timeless ad etched into music history. So what could could MGM have done to elicit this? Did they provide the recording and the producing costs for Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack? Did they let them meet and encourage them to make this album in the first place and then want their share of the profit? I don't know. This is where we need more answers. This is when we need the truth. This post was posted two years ago. And as you can probably see from some of the top comments, there are people who are saying, are you trolling? You're looking too deep into this. Like what is wrong with you? It's never that deep. And two years later, whilst they might not have been 100% correct, their suspicion and their hunch does seem to make a little bit more sense in light of what I'm about to tell you. After I heard this name of MGM, I remembered distinctly in the 24 Karat Magic music video around the beginning section, there is Bruno Mars with a car and in the background you can see the words MGM. Almost like it's like a promotion for the hotel itself like an ad placement which is not uncommon in music videos though in retrospect i do believe that music videos should disclose when they are advertising things in the same way that we are held to those standards as you know content creators why are we getting sued by the ftc but they're allowed to just throw adverts out there that's a whole different conversation for a different day but what i'm saying is is that like the ad placement is normal for videos and it was nothing that i saw out of place but now with this name ringing i'm like something's going on then i ended up finding out that the music video 24 karat magic was filmed at the bellagio and the bellagio is owned by who MGM. And then that made me think there's something going on with this MGM's thing. So then I ended up finding this Wikipedia page that says that Bruno Mars has been working alongside MGM in a residency since December 27th, 2016, and is expected to end his residency September 1st, 2024. 
that is a very long time to do a residency in one space especially if your career is building and growing throughout this time we're expecting a lot of world tours we're expecting you to be in you know portugal belize america england europe because Bruno Mars has only ever done one world tour, which was for his 24 Karat Magic album, the one that completely sweeped the Grammys. Prior to that, between the times of 2013 to 2015, Bruno Mars worked for another casino in Vegas, the Chelsea. So literally throughout Bruno Mars's entire career in terms of commercial success, Bruno Mars at some point has been working doing some kind of residency within Vegas. That is bizarre for a new artist to do. That is a bizarre choice for new artists. Because when we think of residencies, we think of people like Adele. We think of people like Celine Dion, Mariah Carey, shit. Even, even my arch nemesis, because she's my up now, Jayla. So that's when I wanted to find out about Bruno Mars's relationship with MGM. And that's when I came across numerous, and I mean numerous different articles from back in March, stating that Bruno Mars may owe MGM 50 million dollars in gambling debt and that essentially he's still working to pay off his gambling debt at the facility that hosts his residency now all of these allegations have been completely denied by mgm but i'll get into why i kind of feel like mm, i'm not sure i'm not sure i believe you so here we have this article does Bruno Mars allegedly owe 50 million USD in gambling debt with MGM? Here's what insiders claim. Bruno Mars' lucrative partnership with MGM Resorts International takes a sour turn as reports surfaced of the singer amassing over 50 million in gambling debts. Bruno Mars, the renowned singer and songwriter, may be facing some trouble with MGM Resorts International, a major player in the hospitality industry. Back in 2016, Bruno Mars entered into a multi-year residence with MGM and started to perform regularly at the Park MGM Resorts in Las Vegas. However, recent developments suggest that this once promising partnership has soured. According to News Nation, Mars has reportedly lost a lot of money, over 50 million, while gambling at MGM's poker tables in Las Vegas. A source close to the matter reported to News Nation that Mars had purportedly accumulated over 50 million in gambling losses at MGM and they, they pretty much control him now. The source said he owed millions to the MGM. They further added that MGM basically owns him. He makes 90 million a year off the deal he did with the casino but then he has to pay back his debt. He will only make 1.5 million per night after taxes. Part of Mars's deal with MGM included over opening a lounge called the Pinky Ring at the Bellagio Resort. And there are reports of more projects in the works. Now, at this present moment, a lot of these articles with the original story have been completely suppressed on Google's algorithm. If you were to search MGM Bruno Mars 50 million like I just did, you will see that there are so many different major news articles and an NME, uh, The Independent, Daily Mail, South China Morning Post, Billboard, BuzzFeed, Entertainment Weekly, New York Post, Yahoo, Lifestyle, Canada, they are all with articles stating that MGM has shut down the rumors that Bruno Mars owes anything at all. From these articles, basically MGM says he doesn't have any outstanding debt. And I'm like, well, he wouldn't have any outstanding debt if he was still continuously paying off his debt whilst doing his residency as long as he doesn't accumulate any more debt then obviously he has nothing outstanding with you guys you guys have a mutual understanding of y'all's relationship i don't know if i completely buy that this isn't the case but then my thought was wait is there any way to solidify that bruno mars actually does have a gambling addiction problem or may be familiar quite heavily with the gambling world in order to make these high stake bets and lose so tremendously well that's when you can find a literal paper trail of Bruno Mars speaking about his history of gambling 
all across the internet. Like in this video of carpool karaoke between Bruno Mars and James Corden, where James brings up his gambling past and how Bruno Mars used to use gambling in order to pay for his lifestyle and to keep a roof over his head. Take a look. When you moved to LA, is it true that you would pay your rent by playing cards? For a little while, yeah. Okay, so if that's not enough to make you think that maybe there's a history there, there is an article from way back in 2013. You gotta remember, Bruno Mars' biggest first breakout single happened in 2012. So this is very much at the very beginning of Bruno Mars' career, where GQ had sent over an interviewer to do a interview with Bruno Mars and to spend a day with him, like a day in the life, so that they could see his lifestyle and how he lives. Even all the way back then, Bruno Mars ended up taking this journalist into a casino. Yes, that's right. After spending one day with Bruno Mars, asking him various questions about his career as well as his controversies, he got involved in a situation where I think he was found with like a packet of, you know, illicit drugs and ended up doing some community service and stuff like that. So they spoke about that briefly, but beyond that, they spoke about his job, his work, his music, how he writes, all of that kind of good stuff. Stuff. but then the following day the journalist meets up with Bruno Mars where Bruno Mars picks him up and takes him to the casino and just a lot of the things that were being discussed here made me think that maybe this is somebody who has a gambling issue if somebody loses all sense of time that for me at least indicates that that person might have an issue so the article reads Mars picks me up from my hotel around one in the morning as I slide into the back seat next to him he hands me an unlabeled bottle of rum to swig from tomorrow lunchtime he must board a 12-hour flight to japan his first visit there since his stage debut 23 years earlier and he sees little point in sleeping too much beforehand so tonight is for poker there's a few things that take my mind off music and i've just found that sitting down and looking at cards does that he says commerce casino is our destination he says it has the biggest card room in the world it would also be where he would play most often before he became known as bruno mars usually he would come with his friend mo an insurance broker this was just before the sport became so popular i used to pay my rent doing that shit he says what's your style i used to be like a loud mouth you know the guy people would want to take his money if you do get them to lose and they're just out for you they're gunning for you and that's when they're weak and that's when you jump and you pounce on them and what's the most common mistake that people make? Buying into my bullshit. Mars remembers his first casino visit. He was 19, underage, and went to a casino two hours away in the mountains with Jeff Basker, now also a well-known pop producer, but then in a cover band with Mars. They were called Sex Panther. I remember my first bet. My hand was shaking, he says. And a guy called me out on it and he embarrassed me. Mars lost a hundred bucks hundred dollars that he couldn't afford and had no business gambling with you gotta lose he says you just gotta lose to win you understand like already the triggers are like triggering for me right now because i'm sitting here and i'm just like this is giving gambling addiction like i've gambled numerous different times i could not tell you <laughs> where i was what casino what my hand was what what the situation was of my first bet because i don't really have a connection to betting or gambling like that so this was like literally ringing huge alarm bells in my head but it gets worse we pull into the casino driveway past a couple of plaster giraffes and park outside a hallway that leads past the chariots and four horses to the tables here we are he says look at this class.com inside the floor guys who work there greet him warmly a face from the old days when he speaks with anyone he introduces me as his uncle from switzerland each time he sees me jot down a note he'll whisper to me you're gonna get me killed in here he'll later tell me that he brought three thousand four hundred dollars here with him tonight a grown man should always carry cash right he says 
I don't know who told me, but someone told me a long time ago that the biggest turnoff is when a guy doesn't have cash on him. At his allotted table, he slips the cash to be exchanged for chips so discreetly that I don't even see him do it. It's a minimum $600 buy-in on a table like this, but as he told me in the car, most guys buy in for four grand. So if you buy in for the 600, you're basically like Nemo. I noticed that a dealer calls him Peter, though Mars doesn't realize and will seem surprised afterwards when I would point it out. Oh, I didn't hear that, really? Wow, that's like old school or like when I'm in trouble. Play on this table seems careful. There's no gamblers here, he complains to me quietly after a while. It's tight, not my style at all. No one's drunk. Sometime in the second hour, he loses a big hand for several thousand dollars that he felt sure that he would win, but he accepts his loss. As the clock passes past three o'clock and then four, he makes new deadlines with himself to get up from the table. 3.45, 4.15, but each of them passes by. Though I like it here, he keeps apologizing. The sicko wouldn't leave the table he says. I don't think he was so much trying to make his money back, though bit by bit with some quiet aggressive play he does so. It's more that he's waiting for that one great satisfying hand. But a huge face-off never happens and he has enough discipline not to push it. Finally, little after five in the morning, he picks up his chips and cashes out. The last hour has been one slow but steady accumulation and he leaves the casino with $5,070 in cash. Now, when I saw things like he was making new deadlines and pushing the time further and further and further forward, that for me, 100% solidified that this is a gambling issue in my humble opinion. Now, the only reason I'm saying this is because as I said earlier on in today's video, I used to work as a store manager for an arcade amusement center for adults, like the slot machine rooms. And one of the things it is that we would have to do myself as well as my team members and team leaders and stuff, we would have to make sure that we were keeping an eye on somebody's gambling in terms of adhering to the gambling awareness guidelines. There were strict things that we wouldn't allow our people to do. For instance, holding machines for more than two hours. I had an instance where a lady wanted to hold a machine for several hours so she could pawn a TV to bring more money into the gambling facility. We had to reject that because that was clearly her dealing with something and trying to, you know, pursue gambling instead of dealing with what she needed to do, which is to just basically go home. I had another incident with another lady who continuously gambled on the day of her sister's funeral to the point that she never left to go and pay her respects to her sister. This is another thing about losing all sense of time, pushing it further and further and further, using it as a coping mechanism in place of actually dealing with your emotions. Because of these guidelines, I literally know what I'm supposed to be looking for when it comes to gambling addiction. Because had we have not adhered to the gambling awareness guidelines at that point in time i think i was working there up until like i don't know 2013 2014 but if we never adhered to those guidelines our entire store could have been shut down for fostering that kind of environment so losing sense of time pushing time forward refusing to leave a table making big hands and big decisions with little to no payoff losing a substantial amount and desperately trying to claw it back that is indicative of a gambling addiction and not somebody who is playing for fun and had bruno mars had been in my facility doing all of these things he would have been kicked out but you're probably thinking to yourself bruno mars may have had a history of gambling but i mean it's been gosh it's been a over 10 years now maybe he's not that same person that's when i stumbled across another article by somebody who does youtube videos called poker stories where they sit down and detail this one time when they had a thirty thousand dollar pot that they were betting against bruno mars where bruno mars essentially loses the entire hand and has to ask this guy for a ten dollar chip so he could pay the valet when you travel around the country playing cards as much as I have, you tend to collect some very memorable experiences. And one of my favorite experiences happened at the Commerce Casino. I was just sitting down playing the regular 10-20 game that I always played 
minding my own business when in walks Bruno Mars. We got into the game together at about 5 p.m. and continued battling after the sun went down and then came back up again. At about 9 a.m., the morning regs were circling the game like vultures ready to take advantage of me and the players that I was playing against tired minds. Little did they know there was no chance they were going to get in this game. Nobody at that table was getting up for any reason. Everybody folds to Bruno who opens a 200 on the button. I look down at two fives and I decide to flat Bruno's raise. We're playing about $17,000 deep at this point. The flop comes down, jack of diamonds, nine of diamonds, five of hearts. I check with my bottom set. Bruno grabs 400 very quickly and throws it in the pot. At this point, we had played together for about 16 hours, so I had some good indicators that Bruno had a strong hand here. I wasn't super concerned that he has a set, but I knew that he had a hand that he wasn't going to let go of easily. So with that said, I check raise to $1,400, and then to my surprise and excitement, Bruno, after about two or three seconds of thought, grabs two stacks of white $100 chips and pushes them in the middle so he re-raises me to $4,000. So I smooth call the flop. We have about $13,000 left behind and the dealer burns and turns a beautiful deuce of clubs. I check Bruno grabs a pink $5,000 chip and tosses it into the middle, and now I Hollywood as I'm dancing around ultra ultra happy on the inside trying not to let it show because this is a monstrous pot and I am very very certain that I have the best of it. I delay for 45 seconds to a minute and then announce that I'm all in for $8,000 more. Bruno cuts loose a stream of words that I can't say in this video and then starts analyzing the hand out loud. He starts out with, well, he could have a set of nines, he could have a set of fives, he could have jack nine, and I'm like, no, 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 Bruno, get off that, <laughs> get off that train of thought. And then he starts waiting longer and longer and then he starts thinking, hmm, he could have queen ten of diamonds, he could have eight ten of diamonds, he could have a pair plus a flush draw and I'm like yes continue on that line of thought Mr. Mars and as I'm sitting there tanking I, it felt like forever it was probably five or six minutes I remember dreaming in my mind like is this really happening am I really playing a $30,000 plus pot against Bruno Mars I even had to check back my whole cards to, to say oh yeah okay I really do have pocket fives here <laughs> I really do have a set and then Bruno thinks about it, looks at me, and asks, will you run it twice? And because he hasn't called yet, I'm still in statue mode. And then he says, I know him. I know he'll run it twice. And then he eventually makes the call. And then he asks, well, what do you got? And I said, I've got a set. And he said, damn it, I'm drawing dead. And then I said, well, I guess we can run it a thousand times. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I just said, nice hand and the dealer burned and turned and then shipped me this $30,000 pot. And as Bruno stood up to leave the table, he said, hey, Brad, do you mind throwing me a $10 chip for valet? So of course I did. And then he disappeared into the night. Then we have another story on TikTok from a famous Vegas podcaster where he states that Bruno Mars had lost $17 million in one single night. And I just genuinely believe that the wins have to be substantially big in order for you to take such losses. And this is the Pinky Ring Lounge in Las Vegas at the Bellagio. And even though this has been an open secret in Las Vegas for a couple of years now, News Nation just decided to publish that Bruno Mars may be losing a lot of money at MGM. His debts have gotten as high as $50 million, according to sources. MGM basically owns him, a Vegas insider said. Now, I had a high roller tell me that he spent an afternoon at the high limit pit with Bruno and watched him lose $17 million. But I could never say anything about that, nor do I know that to be a fact. 
because this was not published by anybody. But now that it's out and published by News Nation, I decided to go out and put the story out there. Supposedly, he owes millions and millions of dollars to MGM from gambling. And even though he may make as much as $90 million a year, $60 million after taxes, if he owes $50 million to MGM, it's still a rough going for Bruno. I hate to hear this as someone who suffers from compulsive gambling myself. So then that's when it all began to make sense to me. Why Bruno Mars has been in a residency since 2016 with MGM, only leaving them for a short period of time to do a world tour for his most successful album. Why Silk Sonic was again performing a residency at MGM rather than touring the world after such huge commercial success. It made me think to myself, is it possible that Anderson Pack had really begun to realize that he was kind of being duped into helping Bruno pay off his debt or his outstanding debt with MGM and not really in it for the right reasons. Maybe that would be a big enough reason not to go forward with Bruno Mars and continue to go the direction he was before. I mean, this would have had to have been substantial because the Silk Sonic's lead single, Leave the Door Open, was released as a single, a standalone single in 2021 and ended up doing extremely well, winning four Grammys at the 2022 Grammy Awards, including Record of the Year and single of the year, two of the most acclaimed Grammys that one could possibly win. Shortly after that, a year later, in fact, the album An Evening with Silk Sonic was released, completely storming the charts and having numerous different hits included, and it guarded widespread commercial success. Because this album was released a year later, it was then eligible for the 2023 Grammys. And it was expected that this album, An Evening with Silk Sonic, would completely sweep the Grammys yet again. With many believing that it was placed to win Album of the Year. Album of the Year! In Taylor Swift's world, somebody else winning Album of the Year is freaking ludicrous. And you know what Silk Sonic did? they pulled out of the 2023 Grammys. Why? This is what they posted to social media. We truly put our all on this record, but Silk Sonic would like to gracefully, humbly, and most importantly, sexually, bow out of submitting our album this year, Mars says. We hope we can celebrate with everyone on a great year of music and partake in the party. Thank you for letting Silk Sonic thrive. This led me to believe that something bad must have happened. And I feel like my hunch in regards to gambling addiction, paying off debt, and no real career growth for Anderson Park as long as he continues to associate or align himself with somebody who is more than willing to stay stagnant in a residency that allows him to potentially, allegedly, for legal purposes, engage in his vice, which is gambling. I just don't see why a musical duo that was on the cusp of literally taking over the entire freaking world, as well as the Grammy, and also given a massive F you to Taylor Swift, and they just choose not to. They put themselves forward, but then they remove themselves. They remove themselves. It's not even a case of they never put themselves forward. They put themselves forward. They then just decided not to partake. Insane. Ludicrous. What could have happened? And then to top that off, we have not seen anything posted from either of these members as part of the duo since 2022. Something bad happened because there is got to be a lot of freaking money involved in this and involved in this project and to walk away from something so big to go back to doing the stuff it was that you were doing before this level of commercial success for Anderson Pack's trajectory of his career just simply doesn't make sense. But this would not be the first time that a gambling addiction has influenced the structure of a casino's relationship with the artist who is in residence. So this is when we're kind of going to touch on some old school stuff to do with the late great Elvis Presley. Hey. 
Elvis Presley, often referred to as the king of rock and roll, revolutionized the music industry and had a profound impact on Las Vegas. His residency at the International Hotel, now the Westgate Las Vegas, in the late 1960s and 1970s, marked a turning point for both his career and the city's entertainment landscape. However, behind the glitz and glamour of his stage performances, the shadow of gambling debt loomed at large. Elvis's manager, Canal Tom Parker, was known for his significant gambling habits. Parker's addiction to gambling had severe financial implications, leading him to make decisions that ultimately affected Elvis's career. To cover his mounting debts, Parker negotiated extended residencies and performance schedules for Elvis, often at the expense of the singer's health and personal well-being. These agreements were lucrative for the casinos, as Elvis's presence at that time drew in massive crowds, increasing the influx of gamblers as well as revenue. The relationship between Parker's gambling debts and Elvis Presley's residencies illustrates how entertainers can become intertwined and entangled in the financial dynamics of Las Vegas casinos. Fast forward to the 21st century and the legacy of residencies within Las Vegas continues to thrive with contemporary artists such as Bruno Mars. He has enjoyed a highly successful residency at the MGM Park Theater, proves that the fundamental connection between entertainers and the casino economy is still thriving and remains strong. Now, whilst it is alleged that Bruno Mars may have a financial debt, I have to call it a, for what it is, which is an allegation at this moment in time. So we're gonna call it an allegation, even though. <laughs> However, the financial incentives of Las Vegas residencies remain a compelling factor for modern entertainers. Casinos offer lucrative deals to artists like Bruno Mars, recognizing that high profile performances attract affluent guests who are likely to spend money on gambling, dining, and other amenities. The casinos benefit from the increased patronage, while entertainers secure substantial substantial earnings and a relatively stable performance schedule. So it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to believe that the potential alleged $50 million gambling debt could make him what one source had told Newsweek that MGM practically owns him forced to continue a partnership with a casino that could potentially actively exploit his vices for their financial gain, essentially keeping him locked in as a slave to the gambling industry. And it's not like this setup doesn't have its own benefits. For contemporary entertainers, the appeal of Las Vegas residencies go beyond financial gain. The residency model allows artists like Bruno Mars to establish a home base, reducing the rigors of touring and enabling them to create more of an elaborate and consistent show experience. In the cases of Bruno Mars as well as Elvis Presley, it demonstrates how gambling debt as well as entertainers' residencies are intertwined into the economy ecosystem of Las Vegas. For Elvis, the direct impact of gambling debts on his career's decisions highlights the pressures and complexities faced by entertainers in the city's high stakes environment. For Bruno Mars, the financial as well as logistical advantages of a residency can show how these people, these entertainers can thrive within this environment as long as they don't have a gambling issue. Ultimately, the allure of Las Vegas's entertainment scene continues to draw top talent. I mean, we're used to seeing people like Adele, Mariah Carey, Celine Dion take up these kinds of residencies. So whether they are influenced by financial necessity or the pursuit of a stable performance venue, residencies in Las Vegas and exploitation is always going to be there. But my question is, just because it's become normalized, does it make it ethical? Hey, 
So my final thoughts on this entire situation. I genuinely believe that Bruno Mars needs help. Gambling addiction is no joke. This is not to like poke fun at, point fingers at, or even condemn him for the decisions made. But I worry that a major corporation such as MGM or others, because I mean, he's not the only Vegas residency to have found themselves in gambling debt. I mean, look at Gladys Knight. But I feel like he is in an environment where he will always be at a disadvantage. Putting somebody who has a gambling addiction in Vegas is possibly one of the worst things you could do. That is the equivalent of, you know, telling a crack at it to have a little bit of crack every single day. And why can't you moderate yourself? What is wrong with you? Don't you have no self-control? Can't you just take a little bit of crack? Like, no, they need to abstain completely remove it all associations and all that kind of stuff as long as he keeps himself locked into a contract of this nature with a company like mgm i really don't see himself getting any better it has been rumored more recently that he is no longer with his fiance his fiance has been seen not wearing her ring and i mean i can't really talk i never wear my wedding ring but also people sources close to bruno mars have also stated that she never came over and spent time with him over christmas or new year's just gone and they haven't been seen out together pretty much ever since so i don't know whether he's spiraling into a really dark hole but the other thing that i did notice is that any promotional photographs or material in regards to bruno mars he looks drastically thin now this could be a personal choice of his and i'm not here to sit down and say you're too thin or you're too fat do what you want with your own body but when i do notice drastic drops in somebody's physical appearance in terms of weight it does make me worry about somebody because usually it's because their mind is preoccupied with something else they're focusing on feeding one part of their body instead of feeling feeding themselves feeding their soul so i worry about bruno mars i'm i'm a big fan i've enjoyed his music for all of these years i mean even in my university days i used to perform some of his songs i used to sing grenade and in lazy song all the goddamn time in my gigs so he's like become like a huge monumental part of like my musical culture and what it is the kind of things that i, I enjoy and i you know will always be forever grateful to him to introducing me to the amazing artist of anderson park he's so cool if you guys have not heard his music outside of bruno mars i promise you go go forth go on spotify go on to apple music it is so goddamn dope i listen to that stuff all the time but i do think that bruno mars needs some serious help before he gets elvis presley girl because i don't want him to be another sad sad case of exploitation within las vegas Anyway, with that being said, thank you guys so much for listening to today's video. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed going on this journey with me. Tell me what it is that you guys think in regards to Bruno Mars. Like, do you think that like my little hunch might be right? Do you think that MGM might be exploiting Bruno Mars? Do you think that they may be lying about him not incurring any kind of debt considering the, the documented history that we have seen of, you know, his gambling histories and his behaviors around gambling tell me what it is that you guys think in regards to that as well as sin city the world of you know luck and chance and fortune and how that's so similar to how hollywood works everybody's looking for that chance that that moment to make it so tell me what it is that you guys think in the comment section down below i would love to hear your thoughts thank you guys so much for waiting for the next video and a massive thank you to juvia's place for sponsoring today's video and until next time you beautiful and amazing badass bitches it's been Paige. Bye. <laughs> Why did I do that tongue thing? That was so odd. I'm so sorry. I'm so Why did I do that? That was weird. Okay, I'm done. Bye. <laughs>